Hello, this is uh, Steve Wiggum, author of Eclipse of Faith, and welcome to Living Christianly in a Pluralistic Culture. This is uh, talk two of 12. We'll be focusing on pluralism as it looks in Christianity today. So if we look at the world map, we can see that Christianity as a large portion of the United States population. Um, I'm a, a U.S. citizen, uh, so I will be having a little bit of bias toward looking at the world through the lens of the United States. But worldwide, one out of every three are Christians. And so what we're going to do in this conversation is talk about uh, Christianity itself and talk about how it has a pluralistic culture as well before we get into other religions. The, the, the path of our conversation is going to look like this. The first talk was on what it means to live Christianly. We talked about that in the last session. This talk is about pluralism and Christianity. We'll also talk about some of the religions outside of the Christian faith, such as Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Confucianism, secularism, atheism, and also how Christianity deals with science. And then the final conversation will be is how do we actually uh, live this in on, on a very ordinary day like a Tuesday morning. But today it's all about Christ, pluralism and Christianity, so we'll spend all of our time uh, in this realm. It's really important that we understand church history uh, for, before we can really understand the pluralism that currently exists in the church. So what we'd like to do real quickly is give you kind of a fast track uh, history lesson of what have, has happened to the church over time. And the, the very first period of time that we have in church history um, after Christ ascended back into heaven uh, was the, what we call the patriarchal period or the patristic period, as some people may say. This is the time of, um, of the church when it was just forming the first couple of centuries after Jesus ascended back into heaven. And the people who followed Christ from that point forward, how they started to navigate and negotiate what the faith really looked like. And during this time, there was uh, a nice growth all the way through lots of the Roman Empire. It was a very slow and methodical growth, but it was a growth nonetheless. And it wasn't all um, unified at the time. There were a lot of differing, differing opinions. Um, you know, you, you may have heard of the Manichaeans, which was actually a, a sect of uh, Christianity that was uh, that Saint Augustine was first fascinated with before his um, for his conversion into uh, Orthodox Christianity. You also may have heard of the uh, the Gnostic movement, where uh, secret knowledge was a really big part. And if you remember the the discovery of the Nag Hammadi back in 1948 in Egypt, there was a lot of Gnostic gospels, Gnostic uh, texts that were found that explained that tradition. And then there was also a third uh, tradition that really uh, really um, uh, informed the first uh, ecumenical council, the Council of Nicaea, was the Marcion uh, heresy, which was, uh, which if you read any of uh, Irenaeus or Tertullian, who the, were some of the, uh, the first church um, leading spokespeople uh, during the patristic period, um, you find that a little bit about their teaching as well. Um, but w things really changed very quickly. If you remember the history, your history books, uh, in 325 A.D., and that's when um, actually it really goes back into the 314, 315, when Constantine actually converts to Christianity. Constantine, the emperor of Rome at the time, and uh, he became a Christian. And I won't go into his story fully, but it is a fascinating one. If you ever have time, just to go do some research on that, I think you'll find it worth every minute you spend. But uh, Constantine became a, became a believer and just a sh few short years before Constantine became into power, there was a lot of persecution of Christians uh, in the Roman Empire. So he uh, actually um, turned uh, Christianity from a, a uh, despised religion by many in the culture into the one that was accepted by the, the actual um, emperor of Rome. So it became official uh, uh, the official religion of the re religion of the Roman Empire very quickly after that um, so when that happened there was a really a birth of a, a, a very organized church called the, we call it the Orthodox Church and um, that was built upon uh, the work that was done in the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD Nicaea is a small town it's just southeast of uh, is Istanbul today well back then it was called Constantinople and um, in Istanbul um, that's where you can still find a lot of uh, a lot of deep Christian history that's there. But Nicaea is a small town on, on a lake just southeast of of Istanbul, um, and that's where 
Constantine called the brightest minds in all of Christianity together to discuss what is this church and what does it stand for? What is its core doctrine? And from that, the church actually started to thrive. And for about a period that ran all the way up, to, up into the, the first end of the first millennium after Christ uh, was on earth, there was a unified medieval church. And it was all orthodox. And there was, um, there was of course, there's a lot of interesting intrigues in the history. If you ever studied uh, Catholic history, you'll know there's quite a bit there. But there was a unified medieval church. And uh, it stayed very unified all the way up until the point of... Uh, when the Orthodox Church actually split into two. And uh, that happened uh, in 1054 AD, uh, officially, even though it was a slow buildup to this, it didn't, just didn't happen one night, um, it actually was a very slow buildup. That's called the Great Schism. Uh, schism means uh, you know, tearing apart or separating. Um, and so the church actually separated. Uh, the churches of the East, now we call them the Eastern Orthodox Church, you may have heard that term before, uh, differed widely with the, the Roman Church or that was headed up by the, the pontificate in Rome. Um, and so there was a great schism. Now there's a, a, a straw that broke the camel's back that's usually blamed for the schism. And that was an addition of a, a simple little phrase in the Nicene Creed that the Orthodox Church did not like. But that wasn't the real, that wasn't the only reason that the church split mainly because the East North Orthodox Church still worshipped and, and wrote in, in Greek and had its own Greek scholars and authors, and then the Roman Church was all Latin. And um, so there was a difference in just culture and misunderstanding was involved in all of this. But um, that's when we actually see the really the, the birth of a second church, with this, which we call today the Roman Catholic Church. Now that church was still part of the Orthodox Church before 1054, so it's not a new creation at this point. It's just that we, we show it as a separate church from the Orthodox Church. Now, there's a lot of debate. If you're a Roman Catholic, you think the Orthodox Church moved away from, from the, the Catholic, the Roman Church. If you are Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox, you think that the Roman Catholic uh, Church moved away from you. Uh, many Orthodox uh, believers believe that the Roman Catholic Church was just a little bit too innovative. And the Orthodox Church really has stayed true to its moorings. And so during this, uh, after the Great Schism of 1054, there was a real divide between the East and West. Some people call this the East versus West Schism. Um, and that ran up all the way until the time of uh, another big church um, interruption. And that happened during the Protestant Reformation in 1517. That, that fateful date that we actually give uh, Martin Luther for uh, nailing the 95 Theses uh, on the wall of the on the door of the church at Wittenberg and that became as what we know as the, the Protestant uh, Reformation um, and it's been called that ever since and since that all that's been happening we have had this mixture of uh, Orthodox Roman Catholic and Protestant and, a, and the modern church has been splintered into many many pieces so this is the big, big notion. If you look at it, you'll see that the for a lot of us who are Protestant um, and even Roman Catholic, we see that that some of the splits that we have seen have, have been have, have been new and not necessarily something that runs all the way back. Now, if you talk to a Protestant theologian, he or she would say, "Well, we are the, really the true church. It was all the accretions and the additions of ideas of the Orthodox and the Roman Catholics." on top of the old, the traditional religion that they're returning the church to. And, of course, the Orthodox and Roman Catholics would totally d dismiss that, and they would say, no, the Protestants should actually just strip things away from the church that actually is legitimate uh, uh, divine revelation, and they're ignoring some of the things that are really important to the church. And so you have that big schism there. So this is what it looks like in, in, a, in a big, big picture. I think it's important that we understand that. I don't know what tradition you are. Um, I will have a little bit of a bias toward the Protestant just because I am one. I can't help but be that way. Um, but I'm trying not to be as, as biased as, as I can. So please forgive me if you hear a couple of things that may just rumble that direction. Um, but uh, that's an interesting thing. You know, the Christian church has now, for many of us, have, has just been seen as a lot of different ways of, of practicing Christianity. And, uh, we, you know, we just, is this the, the new normal? And that's the big question we need to ask. 
is pluralism and Christianity just the way things are going to be from this point forward? And we'll discuss that in pretty deep detail as we go along. Well, let's run back to the actually the Orthodox Church. This is the, the church that really was um, more associated with the Byzantium uh, Empire, the Byzantine Empire, um, when the Roman, Roman um, uh, Empire broke into two pieces after Constantine established a tetrarchy, tetrarchy if you remember the, the, uh, your history on that. Um, well, the Orthodox Church really took up the mantle for all the churches in the East, and they spoke Greek, and they wrote in Greek, and they worshipped in Greek, in the Greek language, and, um, and we call the Orthodox Catholic Church um, by names in the U.S. like um, Eastern Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox. Inside the tradition itself, many of the, of the uh, theologians still call the church the Orthodox Catholic Church uh, to really um, make its way known. In other words, it's not the Eastern Orthodox. They don't see themselves as just the Eastern or regional. They see it as a worldwide movement. Right now, there's uh, adherents of about 225 million. You will find most of them actually still in Eastern Europe, down into the uh, medieval, I mean, uh, into the Mediterranean area, around Greece and around the, um, around the Levant, all the way up into, of course, into a uh, Russian Asia. And um, they're, they're a very devout group and have been very strong in a lot of, lot of ways. And, and tradition has been a major part of what they've been about. Um, and they're misunderstood by many people in the West because we don't see much uh, orthodoxy in, in uh, North America. We see a little bit more in Europe, um, but there is a, there's some growth in orthodoxy we're seeing around uh, in the North American market. So that's the Orthodox Catholic Church. It's a very large group of 225 million, but, um, but when do you understand that? The uh, other group that we were talking about, of course, is the Roman Catholic Church. And here's a picture of Pope Francis. He's the Pope in 2016. Um, right now, in 2016, the adherents are about 1 billion. So there's, it's a quite large group. It is the largest organized religious group in the world. Um, and so the Roman Catholics have really, he's the pontiff of, of the Church of Rome. Um, and it is, uh, it's got many adherents all throughout the world. Um, and it's very, very, very popular and very strong in not just in Europe, but also in, in South America. You see a lot of that and also in uh, other parts of uh, Africa and even in North America, there's quite a large constituency of Catholics. Uh, so um, an important group and uh, they have been, um, been growing very rapidly in many areas and we see a little bit of, re uh, a little bit of recession of um, their members in Europe and North America. And then the third big branch, of course, is Protestantism. And um, right now their adherents are at 800 million. But inside this 800 million, there's not a unified group at all in here. There's, there's like there's 20,000 sects and counting. I've seen numbers as high as 36,000 different sects of Protestants uh, worldwide. And about anybody who has an opinion or an interesting take on scripture can actually start their own sect. And we see that all over. Um, so many different forms of Baptists, so many forms of Presbyterians and Methodists and holiness and even into some what, what we're considered heretical by some of the more orthodox um, like the Church of Latter-day Saints and Jehovah's Witnesses and a few like that. Um, it's important to understand that they're also included in some of this Protestant number. Um, and um, in the United States, we have a very large Protestant uh, representation and we'll talk a little bit more details on that as we go along. There's another group that um, we haven't talked about specifically because we don't know what to do with it. Is, um, is it Catholic, Protestant, both, neither? That's the Anglican Church or the Church of England. Um, right now they have 85 million adherents. Um, and it is the church that was started by Hen uh, Henry VIII, King Henry VIII in England back in the 1500s, early 1500s, um, in response to a very complicated situation where he was wanting to divorce his wife Catherine who happened to be Catholic and from Spain, and he petitioned uh, the, 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 um, the Pope in Rome to annul the marriage. Uh, Catherine was beyond the childbearing years and had only given him a daughter, and uh, he needed a son in order to protect his family, uh, family's right to the throne of England. And so when the Pope refused to actually annul the marriage, and 
keep in mind the Pope was also really good, uh, uh, really close in, uh, with the family and uh, the, the um, king and queen of Spain and Catherine's family. That created a problem. So Henry decided in the, in the aftermath of what was happening in Germany with Luther, he decided to go ahead and start his own church um, and make it a Protestant church, and that was the Church of England. Now, Henry was a very religious man. You know, he may have been quite the, uh, you know, he, uh, he definitely was the philanderer for sure. He was quite known for his sexual appetite. Um, but when he was actually, um, while still married to, to Catherine, he was actually seeing and, and um, having an affair with Anne Boleyn. And she became pregnant. The pressure really began for him to, to make a move so that he could legitimize her, uh, her offspring in case it was a boy. Uh, in case, well, it wasn't, and that's the problem. So, um, anyhow, the uh, the Church of England was begun from that stress, um, but it never truly was a Lutheran church or a Reformed church like what John Calvin was doing down in um, in Switzerland, nor was it really anything close to what John Knox was trying to do in Scotland. Uh, the Church of England really was just a way of, of just reclaiming, um, you know, just the the church control by the by the king of England and take it away from the Roman pontiff just in order to annul a marriage. And so that's where it all began, <laughs> which is rather interesting. Um, the Puritans that, we, that came over the United States actually are the uh, reactionary group within the Church of England. We'll talk more about those as we go along. But this is where our stock and trade really come out of um, in a lot of um, uh, American Protestantism. So we'll keep that in the back of our minds as we move forward. So looking at the Christianities in, in a kind of a generic way, uh, the four uh, major groups, and I put the Anglican as a fourth group, even though I included them in the timeline as part of the Protestant movement. Uh, I'll keep the Anglican separate, the Church of England. You see the adherent numbers that I shared, shared with you other, uh, on the other slides, but also the basics of orthodoxy. Orthodoxy is what we call right belief, um, and orthopraxy is right, you know, right, right action. Ortho means right, doxy. Actually, the word doxy is uh, used most as the word glory in the New Testament. And the Orthodox Catholic Church makes a big deal about that, that they are the Orthodox Church, and it's really the right way to glorify God. We, uh, in the Protestant movement, use the orth orthodoxy as right belief, and which is that's kind of a, an interesting um, evolution of the, of the term. Um, but the Orthodox Catholic, they say, you know, scripture plus tradition is what really g gives us our orthodoxy and our orthopraxy. Roman Catholics the same. They have scripture and tradition really driving them. And you'll find there's a lot of similarities between the Orthodox Catholic and the Roman Catholic uh, churches. Not a terrible distinction when you get into some of the details. Uh, Anglican is also is scripture plus tradition, but you hear more of their loyalty to scripture. Um, they talk a lot more about the, the, the supremacy of Scripture as part of their religion, but they do have a lots of tradition that drives a lot of what Anglican Church is, is all about, the Church of England. The Protestant, as this actually comes from our good friend uh, Martin Luther, Sola Scriptura, saying that, no, 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 all these traditions are just accretions onto the, the true gospel. They need to be taken off, removed, removed from our, our, our orthodoxy, and we should just rely upon Scripture itself. That's what means scripture alone. That's what sola scriptura, scriptura means. That became a big phrase in Protestantism. It still remains that way to, to this day. Creedal, do they have creeds? Are they, are they um, and you find out that the Orthodox Catholic still espouse the Nicene Creed. Uh, so does the Roman Catholic um, uh, espouse the Nicene Creed. The Anglican tradition does espouse the Nicene Creed. The Protestants also espouse the, the, um, the Nicene Creed with a lot, but there are a few that do not. Some Protestants believe, because of Sola Scriptura, that there should be nothing standing between the soul of man and the Word of God. So no, no creed, no... Um, I happen to be Presbyterian, so the Westminster Confession drives a lot of our, our teaching. Uh, nothing like that would, is, import, is, is really relevant to the Protestant and so there are a few of that are that way, but the overwhelming majority of Protestants really are um, creedal in that they do follow the Nicene Creed as well. Or they probably quote the, the Apostles' Creed, which is a simplified version. 
Um, the highest authority in the Orthodox Catholic is, um, this is the Eastern Orthodox group, it's, it's called autocephalous. Auto means self, cephalous means head. So self-headed churches. And right now I think there are 15 um, autocephalous churches and that they really have to do like the, 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 um, the Greek Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox, the Church in Macedonia and so forth. And they have councils that kind of drive the orthodoxy of these churches. And those councils get together and they discuss and they make agreements on what they what the church stands for. Roman Catholic has the Holy See or the papal prime. Uh, well, the the Pope is the prime um, the prime uh, dis, uh, authority in the church. Now they do have councils as well in the Roman Catholic Church, but uh, the the idea that the the, the Pope of Rome the um, the Bishop of Rome is the Pope, the, pap the, the papacy, and he has highest authority. In the Anglican tradition, it's the Archbishop of Canterbury. Canterbury is a, a town in the southeast uh, part of England where that would be the seat of the highest religion, religious person in the Church of England, even though even the, the uh, kings and queens of England have uh, the role of protect, the, protecting the faith. Um, Protestant, um, it's all about individual conscience and the priesthood of believers. In other words, the highest authority is our reading scripture and the, the inner working of the Holy Spirit for us to be able to discern and understand God's will. So that's what a Protestant actually thinks. Um, sacraments, Orthodox Catholic, um, they keep to the original seven uh, uh, sacraments. So do the Roman Catholic um, and um, those sacraments can be anything from marriage and confirmation and holy orders and extreme unction to baptism and the Eucharist and the, um, I, think, I can't think I got them all, I can't remember, but there's seven of them. Uh, the Anglican Church believes they're in a two plus five kind of mix. The two, there, there are two um, sacraments that are directed by Jesus himself. That is the, the, um, the uh, sacrament of baptism and of Holy Communion or Eucharist. The other five are considered full sacraments and not uh, once instituted by, uh, by Christ, but are still used, and that would be everything from marriage, uh, ordination, uh, and so forth. Protestant only holds to the two that are singled out by the Anglican Church, the Church of England, as being sacramental, um, and those are baptism and the, um, and the Eucharist or, the, or communion. Um, and so those are the two sacraments. Now the sacraments change in their in their uh, a little bit in their understanding is that the Orthodox Catholic, the Roman Catholic, and even the Anglican look at the sacraments as being a means of grace. In other words, you take the the sacrament and are participate in the sacrament, and it actually grace is as it comes upon you through it all. Protestants just look at the the baptism and the communion as a reminder, do this in remembrance of me, uh, as Jesus said, as a sign and seal as opposed to an actual means of grace. So that's a difference in the way that people look at it. For distinctives, uh, the, the Orthodox Catholic are, have a fantastic uh, thought that they really rally around the holy way. They actually are very incredibly um, committed to the glorification of God. Um, and that's why the orthodoxy means so much to them as being the right way to worship. Um, so their emphasis on worship is really un an unbelievable thing. I was able to go to a Russian Orthodox uh, um, church when I was in uh, Odessa, Ukraine, and just watching it was absolutely mesmerizing. It was a beautiful thing. And um, something that, as a Protestant from the United States, I just was so new and fresh to me. And there's a lot of rigor, a lot of discipline, and a lot of dedication that goes into a lot of the things that they do that really make it special. And they call it the Holy Way, and they believe that they are the most uh, historically accurate church because they have tried not to um, um, change. They have not tried to innovate, whereas the Roman Catholic Church has. And their distinctive is that the papal authority, papal authority with um, the Pope of Rome, the, uh, the Bishop of Rome being the leader of the church, and that he's the one that really holds the apostolic succession. And so the Orthodox Catholic 
you know, have other priests of churches, um, uh, bishops of churches who are um, autosalaphic, but um, cephalic, I'm sorry, autosalaphic, I'm sorry if I said it wrong, um, that, you know, that it's not just one, like the Church of Rome. Um, there are veneration of saints, uh, both in the Orthodox Catholic and the Roman Catholic. And if you've been around Catholics or you are one, you know, the, even the mother, even in the, the mother of God, you know, Mother Mary, um, and all of the uh, saints, whether St. Valentine, St. Saint, you know, saint Patrick, or whatever, all these saints are really important as part of the way of, of, of communicating the faith. Now, the Orthodox Catholic, actually, the Eastern Orthodox, use icons as well. They actually have pictures and, of saints and sometimes even little paintings of saints. Uh, not as many uh, you know, physical uh, statues, but mostly just through flat art um, they, they use in order to help them in their worship. So sometimes it's confusing to people who are not in that tradition to think that they're actually worshiping the icons, and they're not. They venerate them, and they use them, and they'll, they'll actually go prostrate before them. And that's odd for us because uh, of us that are not in their tradition because it looks like idol worship. But they would deny that entirely. And so were the Roman Catholics and they're idolizing Mary and the, the, and the um, statues of the saints and the paintings and all that stuff that's in their churches. They would say, no, that is not idolatry. That is just a veneration, a way of communicating our faith um, and the faith of others. The Anglican Church, they have given us uh, quite a wonderful um, gift in the church, and that is uh, the, Book of Common, the Book of Common Prayer. Uh, Thomas Cramner actually wrote. He was actually um, a part of the church when it first started, and a very godly man wrote this great book, and they use it still to this day. It's been, of course, updated here and there. Uh, and then the, the establishment of the 39 articles in the Anglican Church allowed uh, was a really great gift to organizing that church's religion um, and then the Protestant is the Protestant distinctives really has to do with sola fides in other words that's by by faith alone uh, and the justification by faith alone is the real big story of course that was Martin Luther who was very strongly associated with that thought and it became a real striking point between that and the Roman Catholic Church about his criticism of how they actually said no, a faith and works combination was what required uh, salvation. And, and Luther said, no, 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 it's just by faith alone. Um, the Roman Catholics disagree on that thought. Um, they say that, you know, a saving faith does have a works base to it because it's not really saving faith unless it is demonstrating works. And that's, of course, the doctrine of the book of James. And there are quite a few of other passages they use in Paul's writings to make their point. And so there's that moment of stirring between the two. But what that means, the Council of Trent, um, shortly after the, after the, um, the Protestant Reformation, the church tried to make sense of what they thought about the justification by faith alone. And in 1999, to add to the interesting dialogue, is that there was a... A, an agreement between the Lutheran Church and the Roman Catholic Church about what justification by faith is all about, and they published a kind of a joint uh, declaration of uh, the justification of faith by faith. And it's um, so it shows that there's some bridge building between the Roman Catholics and some of the Protestants. Also, the Protestants are very big about the all sufficiency of Christ, and that's the reason why they all the veneration of the saints and Mother Mary and other things of those traditions really are. Uh, are difficult for them to swallow so they run away from that that's why they don't use icons or anything like that because they think christ alone is, should be our focus so that's that so when you really compare catholics and protestants which is a big uh battleground in the united states and the united states and the, and the american church you know a lot of protestants think catholics believe too much that praying to, to the to the uh, to mother mary and praying to the saints and um, and, you know, the idea of purgatory and the Immaculate Conception and all those things that have been, been taught by the Catholic Church um, is just way too much. Go back to the simple doctrines of the Bible is what they are calling the church to do. 
Conversely, Catholics think Protestants believe too little, that they aren't accepting a lot of these great, uh, what they consider to be divine revelations that came through the church um, that are part of their tradition, that are necessary for full faith and are to be exercised in a community of, of faith in the church. So there is that stress. And the big question I have, this is more my question, I don't have an answer to it, but this is a picture of Martin Luther. And I have this question, would Martin Luther protest the Roman Catholic Church of 2016? If he were alive today, would he feel as compelled to protest the way he did in 1517? Because I think it's quite arguable that the Church of 1517, the Catholic Church, is a lot different than the Catholic Church of 2016. There's been a lot of changes. It's been 500 years of history. And uh, a lot of the things that the Protestants have done have affected Catholic doctrine. And you see that in Vatican I, Vatican II, and also in the Council of Trent, that there's been a wrestling with some ideas that uh, have um, created kind of a different church. So I don't know what Martin Luther would do. Um, I always, I always uh, have a kind of a mixed reaction with Martin Luther because I happen to be Presbyterian. And I don't think Martin Luther would like me and my beliefs very much at all. Probably would think that I am not a believer by what I believe about the Eucharist and those kinds of things because he spoke out very strongly against the Reformed faith, especially when he talked to uh, Zwingli from Switzerland, who was a, um, a great Protestant reformer, um, that he would disagree. So I uh, keep that in the back of mind. Martin Luther was quite the interesting person, but I think it's quite, their case could be built that he may be a little bit less reticent to pull away from the current Catholic Church because of some of the strides that they have made in the way they've clarified the doctrine of uh, justification by faith and a few other things. In, um, inside of, um, of, of Protestantism, especially in the, so the southern parts of the United States, I happen to live there, um, is this um, one, one portion of Protestantism called fundamentalism that you may have heard of before. This is a, um, a part of the uh, Protestant movement in the United States that is very strongly and very keenly trying to protect the, the authenticity of the scriptures and what they think is the true faith. Um, I want to give this a little bit of an understanding because we'll use some of these same thoughts when we talk about Islam. But uh, there's a book that was written uh, by some professors at the University of Chicago called Strong Religion. It's the seventh book in a seven-book series um, that goes into a very deep research of um, fundamentalism worldwide. And they don't look at just fundamentalism inside of the, of the Christian church. They also look at fundamentalism inside of Islam inside of Judaism, inside of Buddhism, Sikhism, across the board. Um, and they found out some very common characteristics of fundamentalisms, uh, no matter what the religious tradition, that I thought was interesting. So when we hear of fundamentalists talking, there's uh, quite of a strong uh, fundamentalist overtone to some of the evangelical, especially the conservative evangelical movement in the United States. This may be helpful to us to understand ourselves. Um, and uh, so I bring these to your attention just for, as, as a tool for you to use to understand what's really happening inside of a, a fundamentalist movement. The writers of this book call these um, the fundamentalists uh, enclaves, and those enclaves are a technical term about the, the nature of the community. And um, but here's some things that they say are very common, um, are pretty much uh, common in all forms of fundamentalism, no matter what religion that you find fundamentalism in. First one is, is actually a militant reaction to secularism, thinking that people are moving away from the belief in any kind of God. Also, they consider themselves as the only true believers, even in people who actually claim to be followers of their faith. They're the, the last true bastion of, of, of believers. Um, that's, a, that's a common f feeling that they have. Also, that their leaders pick and choose from history and textual emphasis. In other words, they usually lean on very, very um, strategic and and focused, narrowly focused uh, readings of the history of the church, or the history of their religious tradition, and also the texts, uh, the, the uh, religious texts that they use. So I used to call, uh, since I was have been in and around fundamentalism my, for a lot of my adult life, I used to talk about 
fundamentals is having the Sanctify 250, which is like 250 key verses that were the central ideas of, of the fundamentals teaching. And all the rest of the scriptures were kind of pushed to the side. Um, but that's a very common theme that we see in fundamentalism. Another one is that moral risk is everywhere. It's almost to the point of conspiracy that um, that you just got to be careful because it's just going to overwhelm us all, this moral risk. And that's a very strong, powerful uh, motivator of right living inside of the of the enclave. Another one is, is that uh, they are obsessed with fortifying the borders of their religion, what they call the wall of virtue. Um, I was in the Christian fundamentalist movement. We used to talk about standards a lot. And that was fortifying the borders. We had to define things that are very distinctly. This is what really virtue looks like. This is what it doesn't look like. And they are very obsessed about that. Another one is that it offers moral reward and threatens moral peril. If you stay with the group, you're going to be rewarded for it. God will be in, uh, look favorably upon you for remaining loyal. But they also threaten moral peril outside of the, of the enclave. And so that if you step out, you're just on your own. There's no pr protection for you. And so that's, an on, that's a typical enclave move uh, to really to keep people tied into a movement that they really have no other control over. Um, and they have to use these kinds of moral reward, moral peril, carrot and stick kind of stuff in order to keep people to remain uh, with fidelity to the, to the enclave. And then the, the last one is actually the behavior of enclave. The praxis is highly controlled. They are, you almost define more by what you do than what you believe. And so that really becomes a really important part of how uh, fundamentalism moves forward um, and how it really draws in its community. And so if you've ever been in a fundamentalist group, you probably will say, oh, I recognize all of this. And I do. I recognize it because I've been in and around it for much of my adult life. Um, but one thing I want, want to encourage you, if you've been in and around fundamentalism, this knowledge and this experience can help as we look into other religions that have fundamentalist movements as well, including Islam. And that's where a big, big issue is. We're going to look at these same things and we talk about Islam and see that they have the exact same distinctives um, about how that they interact and work in, in their world. It'll help us understand them more, maybe become a little bit more sympathetic of how we can help people who are who are drawn or, or uh, toward or entertaining ideas of fundamentalism in other religions as well. So this could be a very big help. If you happen to be around people who are fundamentalists, this may give you also a big help in understanding them better and how to communicate with them, not in a you know not, not an unloving, you know, divisive way, but maybe just a way of being able to categorize and understand and be able to show some, some kind of empathy. So there you go. Fundamentals, that's just a little bit of a sidebar, but it's important in the American church. We talked about this before, the Council of Nicaea in 325, and also in 381, the Council of Constantinople, there was a little bit of a modification of the Nicene Creed, but it runs all the way back to 325 AD. And if you haven't got a copy of that, I would encourage you to get one. Um, and um, so it's, I mean, it's just, just Google the Nicene Creed and you can get the full text of it. And it's a really beautiful, beautiful statement of faith talking about the Trinity, the nature of Christ, the, the role of the Holy Spirit, and also about the church itself. Um, and this became the guiding way of looking into the scriptures and the understanding church doctrine was using the Nicene Creed as kind of a frame. And um, it has worked really well for the church and it's kept the unity of the church very strong. Um, and even through some very turbulent times. So I encourage you to get to know it well. Um, most Christian uh, communities do espouse the Nicene Creed. We'll talk about how it actually is upsetting to non-Christian religions such as Islam and Judaism in particular, who have a very close relationship with Christianity uh, in its historical story. But when it comes to theology, there's a, a major break. And the idea of the Trinity that is discussed in the Nicene Creed, of course, is the part that really is the most troubling for non-Christians to accept. So, but the Nicene Creed is there and it will give you an understanding of what the Christian community really believes about its faith. Most important thing to remember is that well over 98% of all Christians today attend a church and, and that actually espouses the Nicene Creed. And if you think about it, 
nice and creative by anyone's uh, imagine by anyone's imagination is a very profound document because uh, it's kind of hard to argue with anybody who believes that as being a non-Christian because it's very strong in its core understanding of the Christian faith. So um, take a close look at that. I think you'll find that very interesting that so many people espouse it that may not quite look like the same kind of people we should be um, thinking are Christian. In one part of the Nicene Creed, the, the phrase that, um, you know, the one holy apostolic Catholic church. And those are four key markers of the church when it is, when it is acting in its, in its purified form, is that it will be one. There will only be one of them. Right now we see that there's more than one in the, in the, in the world. There are thousands of different churches, whether it's uh, Orthodox, Catholic, or whether it's Protestant. And holy, holy means separated. Um, and this is where one and holy kind of get kind of worked in almost in tension with each other. Holy means uh, that there is a purity to the doctrine, and it's hard to hold on the oneness and the holiness when you see people who disagree on key doctrinal points. Apostolic is an important concept that means that all of the church is built upon the apostles and the apostles' teaching, and the Catholic Church believes that it's been passed down the apostolic succession. Uh, to um, to future generations, so that there is somebody who actually operates as, you know, uh, an apostle in our in our time, and that would be the of course the 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 Pope of Rome, and but to even Protestants who look at this, they say apostolic everything needs to be tied back to the teachings of the, of the Bible and also to the teachings of the apostles. Catholic means uh, universal, and what that means is not oneness, but actually is that it covers everybody. There's not anybody outside of the church. It's just widespread. So every creed, um, well, not just every creed, but you know, every uh, race, every language, every location, geography, even time is part of the Catholic Church. So the, the church of 500 years ago is, is inseparably related to the church of today. So that's what we mean by Catholic. And those are four things that actually you can run Scripture back to and be able to prove from the, the New Testament writings that these are really important concepts about what the church really is like. Ephesians 4, 1 through 6, I'm um, using the New Living Translation here. It says, Therefore I, a prisoner of, ser of for serving the Lord, beg you to le lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father who is over all and in all and living through all. And you can see that this, this passage has been a major uh, informer of the um, of the Nicene Creed. Now there's a movement that's happening called ecumenism out there that's really trying to draw the, the church together. As Pope John Paul II said before he passed away, he said, you know, the first thousand years of the church was the church united, then the second thousand years from 10, 000, from 1,000 to 2,000 uh, to, to the current time, the church has been divided. And he's hoping that the the next generation the 2,000 to 3,000 uh, uh, um, millennium will actually be the church reunited. And that was his prayer when he was pope. Interesting notion. There have been a lot of conversations about this, about how we can we draw in this into an ecumenical idea. Um, so it's worth a consideration for us. There have been a lot of people who have been trying to draw the church together. And that's what ecumenism really means, is really just a oneness of the church or the Christian church. Uh, here's some strategies that have not worked to this point. The first one is uh, just reasonable compromises. Well, okay, we'll compromise on Mary, you compromise on this, whatever. And that's the kind of thing that has not worked. It just hasn't really done very well at all. Another one is education and understanding. You know, just deep down we'll find out we all agree if we just keep digging. And there's been lots of attempts on this, a lot of people who have written about these kinds of things, but to no avail. Another one is a uh, strategy is a mystical experience. It's all just kind of worship together and tap into the power of the spirit together. There are even mystical weekends where there are multi, um, you know, multi-denominational 
where people get together and have these mystical experiences. They still have yet to unite the church. Uh, tolerance, let's just get along somehow. Let's just put up with each other and just don't talk about the things we disagree on. Another one is subjectivism. Is that there's really no new truth. There's really no truth, real. It's all your truth, my truth. So it's a subjective thing. Another strategy has not worked is skepticism. Can anyone really know what truth is anyway? Good question. Uh, r rational argument, let's go out into a room and duke it out. Let's just figure it out. Let's just see who's uh, got the best arguments. A vague optimism, that's something well, we'll just turn up. I mean, just give it time. Things will just kind of work its way out. And the last one is, um, you know, it's really a temporary practical union to fight a common enemy. These nine strategies were identified by Dr. Peter Crave at Boston College, and I was really impressed by what he had to say about them. One thing that's really important for us to remember is the answer to this question. Who is the world's most passionate living ecumenist? Well, if you think about it, yeah, it's Jesus Christ. And if you were kind of saying, whoa, wait a minute, that's kind of a trick question, you know, kind of. Jesus isn't alive, though. And sometimes you think about him as not being alive because he's not walking on the earth as a man today. But he is fully alive, according to the Christian tradition. And I happen to believe that wholeheartedly. He is alive and well and in, and in his heaven. Um, so, fascinating. He really, he really was passionate about um, the oneness of, of, of believers. This is from John 17. This is a, a portion of the great high priestly prayer of Jesus um, that he prayed in front of the disciples. And he is praying this. Uh, in front of them, he says, I have given them, them being the, the disciples, he also goes as far as to say in this prayer that the, not only them, but also the people who will believe on me, believe on him after they have gone. So I've given them the glory you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. That's a kind of a tight oneness there. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me. Wow. What an apologetic. Um, and that people will know that Jesus was sent, that he was divine, that he is the actual son of God. He is the, the king of the universe by the unity that we possess. This should make us all shudder a little bit who are Christian, knowing that maybe our little bit of our reluctance to find ways of uniting together may be a, a real insult to, to God himself. And that you love them as much as you love me. This will also be a way of people learning that incredible truth. Um, what do we do? You know, this is a tough thing to ask. Um, maybe there's really nothing we can do because it's just way beyond our pay, pay grade to be able to make these kinds of changes. Only Jesus can reunite the church. We can't. And I think we've got to get to that point. You know, reunification can only occur when we start seeing that Jesus Christ becomes our all-sufficiency, is that he is sufficient in all things. That's Colossians 1. Uh, that's a very Protestant doctrine. In other words, that we really kind of beat that drum hard, that Christ is all, Christ alone, Christ not mixed with anything, just Christ, Christ, Christ. And that is an important thing that, 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 the, that the Protestant movement, the evangelical movement has given the church is the importance of this. And Catholics need to understand that. Is that the reason why most Protestants are reluctant to be able to really reunite is because they don't see that in the Catholic tradition. They see Jesus Christ plus Mary, plus you know, the priesthood, plus lots of other intercessories, even the church itself being an intercessory to God, and not a direct line into Jesus Christ himself, our Savior. And that's problematic. But also reunification can only occur when his body, the church, becomes our most cherished identity. And this is where uh, the Catholics have a huge commitment to it, saying the church is what she is. She is a very special, she is the body of Christ himself. She is um, the most important part of what our faith is about uh, because it is about Christ. He is uh, she is his creation, and uh, it is what is active in our in our lives today is what we do as a body, and we need to be incredibly devoted and loyal to that. Other Protestants have a little bit less of a connection to this. They don't think that is as important. So I think it takes both of them. Protestants need to become better Catholics, and Catholics need to become better Protestants. 
and bring these two ideas together. If we do, then I think we'll draw together. All comes down to Christ and how important he is to all of it. The, not only is the church, um, you know, a, a manifestation of Christ, it is his body. He's the head of the body, as it says here. And he is before all things, Colossians 1 says, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. And this is the reason why that's such an important doctrine. And I love the great hymn that was written by Samuel Wesley, which is the church with one foundation. And I'll just show you the first verse. There are seven verses. And if you want to go research those online, they're worth it. Every verse is just beautiful. The church is one foundation of Jesus Christ, her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. And with his own blood he bought her. And for her life he died. And that's the passion Christ has for the church. And that's the kind of passion we need to have for the church. Will we be reunified in the third century? Like Pope John Paul II prayed and prophesied? I don't know. I hope so. I think that's worth fighting for. Um, and knowing how important it is to Christ's heart should make it that is uh, make it that much more important to us. So, pluralism and Christianity, it is there. Is it an inevitability? Well, it may feel like it. But is it something that we should tolerate and just give into and just say forget? Um, even uh, trying to bring the church back into a unity, that's where I think our work for our generation and the generations to come really does rest. Can we actually reunify the church? And we know that Christ is on our side in, the, in that holy endeavor if we choose to take it on. So that's the conversation on the pluralism of Christianity. I hope it's been helpful to you um, and gives you a greater appreciation for others who call upon the name of Christ and maybe outside your religious tradition. Um, there's more hope than we probably imagine for something really special happening. It would be great if our generation were part of making that happen. So I wanted to share that with you. Next week, what we're going to talk about is actually modern-day Judaism. So I look forward to talking to you about that. And uh, thank you very much, and I hope this has been helpful. This is Steve Wiggum, author of Eclipse of Faith, and, uh, and uh, have a great, great life. We'll hopefully hear from you again.